Um, so thank you, everyone. I know we are still gathering, um, but wanted to be able to at least get a jump start. We know time is precious, so try to make the most of this hour. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm, my name is Ruth Schmidt, and I'm an associate professor at the um, uh, Institute of Technology at IIT, or sorry, Institute of Design at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, and we're a graduate-only design program, the only one in the US, and we're um, sort of more most commonly known as uh, for pioneering human-centered design and systems design. Um, but we also think of ourselves as an international community of designers, learners, and associated folks. So that's kind of where you all fit in. Um, and today is, is, I'm very excited to be the first one uh, to kick off our Latham lecture series uh, for 2021. Um, and this series was named for Richard Latham who studied design at IIT back in the 1940s. Um, and he actually kicked off or was one of the sort of the primary pioneers in the area of product planning. So what product planning is, is a combination of not just doing design and making, but also thinking of design as a strategic and a, a business opportunity. So sort of this combination of both strategy, design, and business is at the core of what he um, sort of founded. And the lecture series that's been going on for a number of years is um, often rooted in sort of this, this basic area. And this year's overall topic and theme is the notion of corporate responsibility. So uh, each of the series, and there's going to be another one coming up um, at the end of April that I will remind you about at the end, um, is about this notion of what we make, but not just what we make, uh, which is sort of a typical design question, but also why we make that. Who is it made for? What are all of these additional questions that we need to be considering if we're going to be responsible makers? Um, and that's kind of core to what ID is also about and the way that we think about design. Um, we're not just makers, we're also thinkers, strategists, designers, and this um, sort of ethical underpinning um, is uh, foundational to the way that ID works and the classes we teach. Um, so to kick us off right now um, for that, and before we jump in, by the way, I should say we're going to have a number of questions that I will lead with our panelists who I'm about to introduce. If you do have questions, um, please don't um, put them in the chat. We will probably miss them. There is a Q&A, so we will devote some time towards the end towards being able to answer questions from the Q&A. Um, so please feel free to use the chat, but recognize that if you put things there, we may not uh, capture them and get to them. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our participants in a moment, but just wanted to first introduce them at a high level. Very excited to have you all here with us, a really terrific bunch of folks. Um, uh, first, we have Morgan Ames, who is a faculty member at the UC Berkeley School of Information. Um, what I'm most excited about, I think, is the remarkable book that you wrote called The Charisma Machine, um, which in my head ticked all the boxes of being a good story well told, but also this wonderful lens that we're able to look at other types of issues and qualities about technology and responsibility. So thank you for being here. Uh, we then have uh, Tapi Saduku um, from Kraft Heinz, the global head of digital employee experience. And um, what I love about what you call yourself, you describe yourself as a corporate doctor who uses technology to enhance the lives of your patients within the organization, which is a lovely metaphor for um, not just sort of taking care of folks, but also diagnosing, problem solving. Um, and in addition to sitting on boards, um, having known you, you also bring what I call like a relentless optimism <laughs> towards the problems that you're solving. So appreciate very much your point of view as well. Uh, and last but not least, we have Evan Sharp, who is the co-founder and chief design officer at Pinterest. Um, full disclosure, um, Evan and I worked together 15 years ago, and I don't say that to remind us that we're all very old. Um, but what I find sort of uh, interesting, and the reason I even raised that, is because we worked together on a project which was related to social and ethical applications of design. And so in a way, this is sort of this wonderful full circle back. It's not a new question, um, but the ways in which we might be thinking about it are different and the ways in which um, you, know, you bring your, uh, your smarts and you humi your humility to you know, driving a big project like Pinterest is um, absolutely relevant to this conversation. Uh, so that's, um, I will stop for a moment. I would love it if you all actually could um, tell us a little bit more about yourselves and perhaps in doing so, you can introduce um, yourselves also in the context of this notion of design responsibility or corporate responsibility. Um, how does that impact your work, your research? Sort of what are the ways in which you personally maybe uh, think about that term and bring it into the way that you, um, you do your work? So maybe we'll start with Evan and then work our way back if that's okay. Sure. 
Uh, hi, I'm Evan. I won't belabor it, but Ruth is being very modest. She was the first person who ever taught me about design, and I'm very grateful for her mentorship and all of the, the lessons that she taught me all those many years ago. Um, you know, when I think about your prompt, Ruth, the, the thing that comes to mind immediately is with a company like Pinterest, with a lot of users all over the world, very different contexts, is how we best create channels to listen to them and hear them and understand their experience so that we're really informing everything we build, not just with the sort of data we have about what people are clicking on or tapping on, but also with their stories and with their personalities and with their context in mind. Excellent. So Tapi, if you don't mind sharing um, a bit about, again, your how do you channel or think about this notion of design responsibility in the work that you do? Sure, sure. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, and I really like the conversation and the question around design because I think we seldom don't ask why we kind of people just do, um, and especially in organisations or in like big technology spaces, I think it's really important to ask yourself why. So as you mentioned, Ruth, I, I work with the Kraft Times company, and for me, the the reason why I think it's important to consider design is that I always kind of like to use this example. You can have like a living room, but you could have like a green carpet, an orange wall, a pink TV. Technically everything is there and maybe technically everything works, but where is the harmony and what's the experience and how are we kind of like enabling people to move through spaces to achieve an objective? So for me, it's why I really love that question about the why. And I, I always try and put people first. I mean, I was trying to understand like, what is the, you know, you, you mentioned about the corporate doctor. What is the purpose? What is the problem? What is the issue I'm trying to solve? And how does the environment enable people to move through it in a harmonious manner? Excellent. I love that, uh, Tapi. Um, so I, I, full confession, I'm not actually a designer at this point, um, as, as Ruth's uh, in, uh, introduction suggested, I am an academic. Um, my undergrad was in computer science, and um, I got involved in human computer interaction research very early and found myself just really drawn to questions of why the tech world is the way it is, what kinds of beliefs animate it. Of course, it's a very diverse, heterogeneous space, but, um, but I try to focus in on some commonalities for some or, or even most of, of that world. And so um, you know, I, ha I have a book out on one laptop or child. I really focused in just on that project and the design process of it, the design choices they made, what that said about these kinds of underlying belief systems that they held. And um, my hope ultimately is that their awareness of these kinds of, of worldviews, these belief systems, these ideologies um, can help foster better design and corporate responsibility, right? It, it helps us step out of ourselves a little bit, step out of those, the, the blind spots that those worldviews can create. Great, great. And that's actually a wonderful segue, I think, into one of the things that um, is absolutely essential and critical to this whole idea of um, design and technology. It's become kind of increasingly clear, I think, to many people, many industries that design is not neutral that there are ideologies and values baked into anything that we do, whether we recognize it or not, whether we like it or not. Uh, so I'm wondering if we can spend um, a little bit of time talking about that. Are, are there examples, you know, uh, Morgan, you mentioned this idea of blind spots. How do we become aware of our own blind spots when we're, when we're thinking about what to make and why we're making that? How does, how does that, how are we both um, responsible for that, but also how do we keep ourselves accountable? Yeah, um, I, I approach this in my teaching every semester, and it's always a challenge, right? Because um, anthropologists like to say that, you know, the ideology that we are, that, that undergirds our beliefs, that kind of steers us in particular ways is almost like water to a fish, right? It's, it's so, it feels so natural, right? Um, one thing that I try to do is, is just try to teach the kind of historical trajectory of some of the beliefs that we might have. And, um, and that helps show that they aren't inevitable, right? They aren't natural. They are something that um, are have historical contingencies. In some cases, they are actively constructed by various people. Um, and that isn't to say that anyone is outside of this, right? Um, there's there's sometimes discussion of of uh, tech workers as as um, puppet masters, kind of pulling the strings on the rest of us, but. 
they we are all part of it, right? Tech workers are have have um, particular worldviews. Users have particular worldviews. One that I focus in on in a lot of my work is how people think about childhood in particular. And when we think about children, we might think about oh, they're they're closer to nature. They're not bogged down by all of the the concerns and 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 such that we adults have. Um, they're a little bit wild, but um, but I push back against that and say that those are also very specific cultural ideas of childhood that are rooted in a particular age. They have particular kinds of consequences, right? So if we look at post-World War II childhood, for example, that's the time when we really try to get this kind of expansive creative play with a massive amount of toys, dedicated toy rooms. And this fosters a particular idea of childhood. And it turns out a particular idea of what good creativity is, right? We, we want to foster creativity in children. Um, and I look at how that kind of threads through the, the tech world, how people talk about children, how they draw on ideas from their own childhoods. Um, so that's just kind of one instance of, of one of those big um, kind of belief structures that, that steer the way that we think about the world. So I'm curious, um, Tapia or Evan, in, in the contexts that you uh, participate in, are there other ways in which this notion of kind of cultural influences uh, that we may not even recognize inform both what you make, how you think about the people that you're designing for? You know, I, I, this has got me thinking actually, because I'm sure you guys can tell I'm English, although I actually now live in Chicago. And I was thinking, how do I kind of keep my mind open to new ideas? And, and the truth is I expose myself to a number of different people and a num number of different concepts so if I think back to this um the pre-covid world I remember I would so in the University of Chicago you can go and see like medical symposiums I would go and sit on some medical symposiums because I would think okay how do doctors encourage patients to take medication I'm assuming that what I'm trying to do is the same although my medication is different um I, I also recently read a book about the democracy of honeybees and about like fungus and anyway my, my mark the moral of the story here is that the way I try to kind of keep myself as open as I can is to expose myself to a number of different ideas. However, I can also imagine that on the flip side of that, you can say you only expose yourself to ideas that you're interested in and neglect the ones you're not. But I think kind of remaining open-minded and also knowing that like being a bit uncomfortable is not a bad thing. I used to kind of not really like a lot of confrontation, I'd say in the workspace, but I realized that that brushing up against people at times can actually also in, give you that different perspective that you would not otherwise have. That, that, that speaks to me, Tope, because I was just thinking about my experience moving to Silicon Valley, whatever that means, moving to the Bay Area, um, about 11 years ago. And, and to generalize, just encountering how intellectualized the the culture is here and how analytical and deductive and and how hard it was to run into people in some of these technology companies who uh, are attuned to other ways of knowing mm -hmm. and an impact of that for me I think has been how difficult it's been to think about different ways of measuring value and building software products there's such an institutionalized methodology when it comes to scaled internet services you ship things, you measure them, you iterate, you do that in a very sort of codified way across many different companies. And it's been really difficult to try and build a culture that thinks more holistically or more empathetically about outcomes beyond behavior, beyond what's really easy to measure. So I'm not sure if that's getting at your question, Ruth, but that's what came to mind for me. No, no, that actually is leading right into a, a whole other really interesting area. So again, a great segue, because that um, before we even uh, joined today, people were sending some questions and there were a number which were around exactly that issue. So maybe we can um, kind of pull those up and start to talk about that too. I think in, uh, you know, certainly when we hear about things like sustainability, right, there's sort of these bigger issues that designers are also dealing with in the big picture sense um, that run into exactly what you're describing, where the measurable things that we're looking at that we're trying to do are limiting and they don't necessarily measure important things. Um, and even the term value, right, in a business context often gets, unfortunately, kind of funneled down into like return on investment and things that are, again, very easily measurable, but also tend to signal the health of a company or the health of an organization in very specific ways. 
Um, so maybe that's something that we can actually unpack a little bit um, and talk a little bit about now too. Like what are ways in which recognizing and appreciating and um, understanding the different types of value um, cause that's a big part of, of responsibility too. It's not just responsibility to stakeholders, which often dominates. How do we, how are we responsible towards um, both colleagues, peers, users, et cetera? Um, are there stories that you may have that can help us to understand that in your respective areas? You know, it makes me think of the, the work that I do is very difficult to measure. And like, I, I look after employee digital experience. How do you quantify experience? I mean, there are byproducts and there are signals as in people spend less time in meetings, for example, or people, this is like people's network, or these are the people that people connect with, but they're not really measuring a fruitful experience. And some of the challenges that I have, I mean, my aspiration is I just want people to come to work and I want them to feel good. And I want them to feel all of a sudden that they just feel better. And then they maybe look out the window and feel, I'm like looking out the window now and they feel creative and inspired. That's like my aspiration. But the ability to, to measure that is, it's, it's hard. It's like sentiment. And it's also about how you feel. It's not exactly about the reality. You know, sometimes there's, there's a disparity between what really happened and how the individual perceived what happened. I don't know if you've seen that picture of the six on the floor and there's one person saying, oh, it's six. And then from the other angle, the person saying it's a nine. And I think it's hard to measure value in the old ways. I sincerely believe this whole shakeup we've had with the pandemic will, will force us to reassess how we measure output um, and input, but specifically around values. It's a challenging one. I think we probably even have to maybe redefine the term. Because for me, as I mentioned, I just want people to come to work and I want them to feel great. And I want them to feel as though they're aligned to their purpose in life. And all of a sudden they feel creative and inspired. That's like my aspiration. Evan, do you want to go? I'm, I'm happy to jump in if not, but if you have any go ahead, thoughts. Morgan, if you don't mind, yeah, I'll go. Whatever is more comfortable for you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I, <laughs> So as an academic, you know, I, I think that I don't deal as much kind of day to day really with with these these kinds of questions like Evan and, and Toppy do. So I'm very happy to hear from them. But I often think about our responsibility as academics to train people who go into these spaces and do this kind of work. Right. And um, and I think one thing I really try to sensitize students to is um, you know, Toppy, you talk about that, that moment of inspiration, right? Um, wh what do you end up drawing on in that inspiration? What kinds of um, assumptions and worldviews do you do it? And I love, Toppy, that you talk about kind of broadening that as much as possible. And I think that there is a lot of promise in practices like participatory design, in really decentering um, the designer's worldview and background in a way, but that can be so hard in a way that might that sometimes disrupts that flow that designers might feel they might feel less comfortable. Um, and, uh, but I, I feel like embracing that is really important in a lot of the, the projects that I've studied in detail, there wasn't enough of that right there was a really a, a strong feeling among those in the project that they knew best that their worldview was the one that they wanted to to push to other people and that other people would want this moreover um and you know many of these projects ended up kind of falling down and failing in various ways in part because there was a, a disconnect between those beliefs and and uh the realities of people's lived experiences in the world I tell you what, though, I'm actually thinking like, to what degree do we need to define value? Because, and, and maybe that's me just being a little bit provocative, but I think, why do we always have to have something that we can measure? It doesn't really, it's not necessarily how we move through life. For example, if you feel loved by someone, you don't say, I feel loved and I can measure it through X, Y, and Z. You just do and actually look at what that enables you to be able to do in the rest of your life. And I think, well, maybe that's the, maybe we can shift our mindset even from looking at specific design. Of course, if you create an organization or if you create a particular piece of software or a tool, you want to know that it's being used by, by your end users. Um, and you want to know it's adding, it's like contributing towards something great. So there are obviously things that you want to be able to measure, but maybe we need to kind of step away and stop trying to quantify design in these historical ways, because look at other things in life. We don't necessarily do that when it comes to things like love or happiness, you know, all of these other emotions that exist in reality. 
I think for me, it's a both and, you know, I think measurement creates so much rigor and objectivity and it, and that it's really important because it, it helps cut through subjectivity, right? And so like, if, if you can measure something, you really can touch on a piece of a truth in a way that's really important, I think, to moving something forward. But to, to agree with what Morgan and Tape said, I think the impact of measurement in my, in my world is often that we become blind about what we can't measure. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's, that's the tragedy. That's when bad things happen is when people don't stop to consider what we don't know or can't know. And especially when we don't value that, that, that leads to all sorts of bad outcomes. And so I think, I think I said this earlier, but one of the ways we try and combat that is we augment what we can measure with, with stories or experiences or voices that fill in the more subjective, less measurable parts of the outcomes that interest in this case is having in the world. Um, if I might, sorry, Ruth, just yeah. add on a little bit on that. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, teaching data scientists who in many cases come to me like very firmly believing in, in the, the value of measurement. I think one thing I, I really try to stress is, um, you know, who gets to ask the questions? Who is, who is taking those numbers? Who's adjusting the data set to be kind of regularized, right? Um, and what happens, you know, if you're categorizing, what happens to those who maybe fall on the borders or fall through the cracks of these categories? Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we have a faith in a way in uh, quantification that doesn't address the subjectivity that is also in numbers, in all of those choices that we inevitably make when we when we take measurements, when we adjust them, when we categorize them, when, you know, all of those, uh, when we decide what's significant and what's not. So, so yeah, I just to, to add a little bit from, again, from my uh, own teaching. Well, and, and what that does also, it opens up for us um, a really interesting area too. And a number of you have said, and I think Evan, you even specifically use this word of stories and this notion of narrative. So some of the things that we're talking about, Tapi, when you're describing like, do we need numbers to describe things like love or responsibility, right? Some of these things, if they get reduced to numbers, we may end up stripping out the interesting stuff for the hard parts in some ways. Um, when we think about the notion of stories, of narratives, whether it's the narratives and stories of the people who are on the receiving end, but also the sense that oftentimes the stories that we makers, designers, leaders, et cetera, tell ourselves end up um, defining what gets made or getting invested in that. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit just about the sense, you know, what happens when these narratives conflict, for example, um, the narratives of somebody who's making and somebody who's, who's consuming or on that receiving end. Um, how do those stories that we tell ourselves impact both what we make, but also the responsibility that we have if those stories don't connect? So I realize that's sort of an abstract question, but I think in each of your experiences, um, you may have aspects of that that I would love to, to hear about and, and talk about in a little bit. Maybe I'll start this time to give the other two a chance to think. Um, <laughs> you know, in my experience, I'll talk about the designer with a capital D, which is dangerous, but, um, you know, my experience of the designer is that the designer is a translator, translates ideas and knowledge and insights into the language of craft and production. And they really, you know, the designer is really a bridge between theory and story and business and the disciplines that create and make in the world. And one of the impact, you know, one of the things I found, I studied architecture in graduate school and I studied history undergraduate, but in, in architecture, I think a lot of the education that I received was as much about how to tell a good story to a client, how to present, you know, how to create something that is compelling. And, and I think when I think about the history of design that I know, so much of the economic context of design has been in this client relationship where really success or failure of building or not building in an architectural sense is really dependent on the ability to convince somebody to buy or, or sell or build. And one of the, the joys and, and one of the privileges I've had the last 10 years, I think has been able to work on the same product continuously for 10 years without the need to sell it to a client. And it, it just, it's just a completely different way of relating to story and relating to 
um, design. And I'm not saying it's better or worse, but I think it's much rarer still in the world to be able to have the opportunity to do that. And I think it leads to very different, very different relationship to story, but I'll, I'll pause for a moment. Um, yeah. If you want to go, go ahead. <laughs> I have some okay. thoughts. But... Okay, sure, no problem. Evan, I was actually thinking about what you were saying about the fact that if you don't have like a, the way I interpret it anyway, like this financial incentive, you can still remain um, kind of connected in, in a new and different way. And I was actually thinking back to some of the things that, I guess like in the main area that I work in, and I was thinking, well, how do... do, do Hmm. Well, maybe I'll, I'll hand it over to you because I, I want to make sure I form my thought before I. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Um, so Evan, I, I, your, your, your metaphor of the designer as a translator really stuck with me. Um, because hmm. I feel like a lot of what I do in writing and in teaching is also a, a kind of translation work, right? Hmm. Translating from, uh, you know, a messy, research process or the messy experiences that um, that I see in, in participants, for example, into a clear story, into a clear narrative. And inevitably, there's a lot that gets left out, even in, you know, academic writing tends to really try to grapple with that messiness and, and revel in it in a way. Um, but uh, there's still so much that gets left out. And I often think that you know, writers and designers have at least some responsibility to really seriously consider what gets left out and, and why. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. and maybe even account for it a little bit. Certainly in my talks, I talk a little bit about like, you know, what stories didn't I tell in the book and why, right? What stories don't I tell in other research projects and why? Um, as far as the the question of stories that that conflict, um, often I've run into this when there is a difference in those worldviews. So if we look at, again, one laptop per child, just because that's um, something I've looked into in, in great depth, there were a lot of stories about childhood circulating in that project that were drawn from people's own memories of their childhood. And it wasn't even necessarily what actually happened in their childhood, right? It was, it was this memory of this, this attachment they had to a uh, computer. Um, or an, a different device in their own childhood. And they remember it just as them and the machine. And they don't remember the whole collection of support structures around them. Who got them the machine? Where did they go with questions? All of those sorts of things. So I often think about the ways that we are culturally drawn to kind of hero narratives, right? We love those individualized stories of, of an individual coming to a realization or overcoming. And we tend to neglect those sort of bigger structural things in part because they're really hard to tell stories about. Mm -hmm. And um, so one thing I really try to wrestle with is how can we tell stories about infrastructure? How can we tell stories about, you know, big social systems, um, ideologies, these sorts of things? And it's hard. I mean, I think a lot of, of um, you know, academics over the decades have, have also wrestled with this. Some have done it better than others. Um, but I do feel like there is, you know, that, that, that idea of us doing translation work is something that that really, really resonates with me and, and something I wrestle with as well. Okay. Thank you, by the way, Mohit. Um, <laughs> I the reason I pause is because I thought I don't I don't always want to just say, well, why do we have to? But I guess listening to both of you makes me even realize that what's wrong with the stories conflict. I remember a friend of mine who's an engineer, she once said to me, Toppy, it's good if some if it's good when the end user uses something you've created in the way you intended, but it's better when they use it in a way you never imagined. And that's why for me, I just think, well, even if there's this, even if there is that like slight not tension, but disparity between input and output, then that might not necessarily be the worst thing. Um, if you think of like translation. Even then, I kind of think like when you think of like languages forming, you have like a you have basic language and then it's built on and somebody else is able to kind of come in and make it even more elaborate. And I guess in that case, if you are like if we believe that design is like a true, true, sincere translation, then allowing someone to kind of take that button on is not a bad thing. Allowing someone to use it in a different use than you intended is not a bad thing. Now, I can also on, this, on the other side, imagine someone can say, well, what happens when it's used for 
less favorable outcomes. And I think then we do have like a moral obligation to be, think about like ethics and design um, and really consider consider multiple different inputs to make sure that we are, do have a more comprehensive view of what we are designing. But nonetheless, I think there's, I like the tension of things being used in newer, better, more exciting ways. Well, and what, what you're, what the thread that you're pulling on now, I think, is one of the things I'll admit that I'm always fascinated by, <laughs> that slippage between uh, production and consumption, which, you know, used to be, it sort of felt like at least like there's a right way of doing things and a not right way of doing things. And if you were the one on the receiving end who wasn't doing it right, it's like, ah, you're the one who's screwing up. There, there does seem to be increasingly um, sort of the recognition that, um, call it, I, I guess hacking was the old word for it, but like being able to sort of bring yourself in your own ways um, to uh, use what's there and that there's not a right or a wrong. And um, yeah, that maybe it's more a matter of recognizing what those tensions are developing or delivering rather than tension being bad mm -hmm. um, in the way that you're describing it. A friend of mine tells a story about, he always says, if you gave a child a paper, if you gave an adult a paper clip, they would just say, it's just a paper clip here, add paper. If you give a child a paper clip, like how creative they can be and actually who knows what comes from that. And I think if you want to like contribute towards like the progression of the world, then things can be used in new novel ways. They should be malleable enough and we should be open-minded enough um, for things to be explored. So um, if we expand this, we've been talking uh, in a bunch of different ways about narrative responsibility. Um, one thing that I would love to also probe um, is this notion of a few of you, again, have used words like experience. Um, when does responsibility start or stop for us who are designing or producing things? You know, So the notion of an unintended consequences, for example, pretty well known, you put something out into the world, maybe it doesn't do what we thought it was going to do. Um, I think uh, when we had spoken a number of weeks ago to prepare for this, Evan, you said something that stuck in my head about like, how are we responsible for things post-occupancy um, with your architecture background <laughs> coming to the fore? Um, how do we think about that? What are both for, positive, you know, for good and for bad, how do we think about that notion of responsibility when we're no longer on the scene? Um, designers are not always along for the ride. How might we unpack that? How might we think about um, how that's important and what, what is our role as, uh, as designers or design adjacent folks? Happy to start if that's okay. Um... You can think a little bit. I I have loved. Um, I have a colleague, uh, Deirdre Mulligan, who is a brilliant legal scholar and um, thinks very carefully also about, um, you know, technology, uh, technology processes, um, artificial intelligence, most recently, and other algorithmic processes. Um, and thinks about how to bring some of the deliberation that happens in kind of legal processes and legislative processes into the technology design world. Um, the technology design process has largely been very opaque. I mean, those who, who do it obviously are part of it, but um, for those who are outside of it, they don't have a lot of input into it necessarily, right? They don't have a lot of visibility into how it works um, and how decisions get made. They might be brought in kind of for a focus group or a usability study at some point, but those are the main points of contact. Um, you know, she has been, and others in this space have been talking a lot about how to bring more deliberative processes into technology design itself. And I feel like on the one hand, this is not going to probably be super popular in the technology world. It's going to make technology processes longer. It's going to introduce a lot more, you know, very voices pulling in a lot of different directions. But I like the the notion behind it. Again, it gets back to this this idea of participatory design, but really deeply participatory, not just at a few points. Um, so I, I bring that up. Um, I also just want to briefly mention. Um, in, in algorithmic studies in particular, a really interesting idea around contestability. And so, of course, in legal processes, this is, this is built in in due process. You know, you have a right to know how decisions are made about you and you have a right to push back on them in various ways. And again, kind of bringing the same idea into maybe algorithmic processes, into technology design. How do people understand what kinds of decisions are being algorithmically made about them? And what kinds of mechanisms can we build in so that people 
people can push back in some way and in some meaningful way, right? I feel like there are a lot of systems that are contestable technically. Um, you, you can hit the flag button, for example, but then there's just another algorithm that kind of adjudicates that. Or maybe there's a very low paid worker somewhere else that ultimately makes a very kind of rapid fire decision about, um, about your flag. Um, you know, how can we build in a little bit more in, in deliberate, deliberate, deliberatively interpretive, sorry, um, processes um, along the lines of, um, of those kind of legislative processes in. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, to hear any other reflections you have from much more on the ground. I always take that, that academic view. <laughs> um, I can maybe respond, Morgan, to some of what you're talking about. Because we do a lot of, I mean, we have a lot of, we have a lot of algorithms. Um, it's really tricky to, you know, I, I think we've, we've tried for years to help our users feel in control, like they have agency and recommendations say. And what's difficult is just realistically and practically, and I'm getting very in the weeds here, but users, they, they tend not to interact with controls or settings. I remember, I mean, I worked at Facebook for a year, many, many, many years ago. Didn't really like it, but we, we built this thing to filter the newsfeed. Oh, do you want to see more or less of this? More that? Nobody used it. And then at Pinterest, you know, we've built all sorts of tuners and, and tried to build controls on individual objects of content. And I'm trying to get as it's been really, it's, I've really struggled to know how to help users exert their agency or, or preferences or, or, or how to express anything beyond like a really negative, oh, I don't like this. And so I don't have a solution, I'm sorry, um, but I wanted to respond to your point because I think it's a really critical one going forward for this media environment that's been built. You know, I had one response to you, Morgan, and actually now listening to Evan, you made me think of something else because I guess what what I what you're describing in my opinion, Evan, is this idea of making things like easy. I don't know how many people are familiar with this. Uh, this is like behavioral science, right? This concept of libertarian paternalism, the idea that you know you create. <laughs> you kind of guide people in a direction which is good for them but you also give them the option and i'm really probably oversimplifying here we also give them the option to do like to have free will and autonomy and agency as you describe it evan and for me i, I was i was just thinking of some of the more recent conversations that i'm having especially when it comes like using data and to what degree do we have access to use employee data and what degree do, you know what do we do with it do what degree do we kind of democratize the data so give it to people so they can see too and there's, there's, a, there's a really interesting conversation going on now between a number of different parties like our ethics council, like legal, um, human resources, technology, all these different parties. And I guess for me, I, I, we haven't got an answer to it. It's still a conversation. Nobody really knows the right way. No one knows the right answer. And actually, maybe that's my answer. That, well, we probably always feel like someone has to take that final decision. And typically in the past, there's always been one person who said, this is right or this is wrong. Now we're in this kind of like gray area. And, and to what degree do we design things? You know, to what degree do we say, these are the default settings? Like who chooses the default settings? Who chooses what is the right thing? It's interesting and uh, transparently, we, similar to you Evan, we don't have an answer right now. I'm of the belief that we should just test an experiment. Probably why I like to describe myself as this corporate doctor or a scientist is that I just want to test. And I want to see what happens. And I want people to kind of come on that journey with me, knowing that it's not solid, it's not formed, but we're, we're trying to figure it out. Um, that's probably where I am today. Maybe if you ask me in a month's time, I could be closer to, closer to the answer. But um, today, I just, I think testing and experimenting is a place that makes me feel good. I think you all point to also that there's just like no, the incentives are all wrong, right? To really take your time with design, to do this really deliberative process where you're really involving community at a deep level, because um, it takes more time, it takes more resources. And unless there is something that compels you to do that, it might put you behind competitors, right? So what kinds of incentives might we be able to put in place to encourage this for everybody? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to respond to what I heard from Tope because it resonated with, I think, how I would answer your question, Ruth. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if design is a sort of translation, a sacred translation between idea, theory, and, and building and practice, 
one thing you can do, and I heard Tope doing this, is embedding different views into that translation. So you can embed a moral or ethical view. You can embed a compassionate view to go along with a quantitative and a business view. And, and I think the danger of doing that is people can end up feeling paralyzed by all of the things they don't know. And the impact of that is nothing happens, nothing gets done, you don't learn anything. To Tope's point, you're sort of stuck in paralysis. And so I, there's a certain balance you've got to strike, like she said, I think, between being careful and being extremely considerate and open to different perspectives and blind spots, but also being decisive and moving forward so that you learn and improve continuously over time. So this actually, um, I have dozens more questions I can ask. I'm also um, starting to get a question or two from some of the Q&A, and one of them actually piggybacks a bit on what we're describing now. Um, so this notion of, of learning and uh, yeah, having things not work is not necessarily a failure, right? It's the opportunity to understand more. Um, one of the questions that just came in is, um, do, you, do any of you have stories about something that you did regret um, that you've put out into the world or that you have um, designed in, in any form of that word, big D, small d? Um, you know, where does regret come in? Are there times when uh, that you can either personally or stories that you can reflect on from others that you can share? I can go first. For me, regret is something that I just, I, I don't think there's anything that I regret in my life. And by the way, I'm not a perfect person and I haven't done everything perfectly at all. I just refuse to have, I know it's a word that exists in the, in the English vocabulary, but it's just not a word that I choose to acknowledge in my own life. Because if something is good, then fantastic, I get to move forward. And if it didn't go as well as I hope, then at least there's an opportunity for, for me to learn. And there, there is always an opportunity for me to learn. I was, I was reading something recently about I've forgotten the name of the company now, but they were making medicine and actually somehow the medicine was tampered with and actually it was due to something along the supply chain. And actually they use it as an opportunity to really bring it, customers on that journey. They were very open and transparent about the investigation and kept people informed along the whole way. And actually to the point that their share price increased, I really have forgotten the name of the company now, but I'm, it's probably like a really big one. And it, what that story made me realize is that you, in life, you always have an option, right? You can regret. And if you choose regret at that moment, that is the end of the story. And that's the end. If you choose to refuse to acknowledge regret, then you have the opportunity to learn and grow. And who knows, maybe you create something bigger and better at the end. So that I'm struggling to think of something that's gone bad that I would regret because that would mean I've given up. And as long as I'm like breathing and alive, I just don't give up. Um, there have been things that I've done where I think, okay, probably wouldn't do that again. Okay, here is how I would do it going forward. I remember I made a huge strategy with all of these different metrics and it was just so complex, it just did not work. This is a number, a number of years ago. And I thought, okay, it doesn't really work if you do something in isolation, you probably have to bring people on board. So I guess if I was to regret that, I probably would have just stayed in that moment. But here I am a number of years down the line and I think, okay, I learned from it. And actually it's bigger and greater now. So that's that relentless optimism that I associate <laughs> with you. <laughs> um, yeah, Morgan Evan, uh, any any thoughts? You know, whether personally or also, you know, uh, cautionary tales are also useful if that comes to mind. I can go if that's helpful. Um, for sure. I'm like Tope. I feel a lot of regret. Um, <laughs> No, but I mean, I think, you know, with an emotion like regret, any emotion is always a functional adaptation. So what is the point of regret? It's probably to learn something mm -hmm. and to change something. And so, you know, one story that comes to mind is a couple of years ago, we realized we'd been sending a lot of emails and by a lot, I mean hundreds. So that's not a lot in the scheme of like a multi, but a lot of emails that had some content that was like depressing and self-harm oriented mm -hmm. in a different country, in a different language. And we hadn't built the right filters to detect it in that language. And the impact of that is, you know, some users were receiving content that was not healthy emotionally. And I regret that. And I, and I, I mean, I'm not telling this story very well, but I think one thing I've really learned with building an organization, which is a little different than building a product is you can also build in values. And so one of the things that we really striven to, to build into to Pinterest is how you respond to a moment of regret. You know, do you respond by being defensive, by, you know, pushing back, or do you respond by rapidly shifting what you're doing and making that the number one priority at the, at the, in the team? And, and so I, I just like, I'm not sure what I'm trying to share, but I think that's been something that we've been really intentional about trying to build into the organization 
is a relationship with, with regret that's open, that's a learning focus, and that's action focused. I, I love the the tone for both of these, right? Speaking to to learning and growth. Um, and I feel like those moments when people realize something didn't quite go right are actually really important moments in the design process, right? Because nothing ever goes perfectly all the time. It's those moments. I, I remember one of my early uh, classes in uh, qualitative methods in how to do interviews and observational studies is to turn towards conflict, turn towards those moments of, of tension. Um, as people, as humans, we're often inclined to turn away from them, right? But for sociologists or for anthropologists, those moments are when a value, when a, a community's value system is really most on display because people have to grapple with this didn't go right what's what's going on we don't agree um, and they have to articulate why and what's important to them right and um, so as a researcher I always kind of turn towards those moments obviously with as much compassion as I can because everybody does make mistakes they things don't go the way they expect um, and it's in I think it's Tope so wonderfully put. Um, it's in grappling with that, right? It, it, that we can learn, that we can grow, that we can start stepping outside of the kinds of assumptions that we make. So this is, um, thank you all for sharing those stories, first of all, because I think, um, you know, it's one thing to talk about responsibility in this very abstract way. And I I very much appreciate um, you're all sharing stories that are about um, like real human responses um, to responsibility, not just sort of the check the box kind of exercise. Um, so just to piggyback on that, um, and then I'm gonna turn to another one of the user questions, but th this one of the things that I know that we struggle with at ID is when we're training designers, training people in design uh, requires certain skill sets and development leadership skills are kind of a different bag. And oftentimes as we move up in organizations, for example, or we take on leadership roles, we kind of have to make that up <laughs> as we're going, right? That's not always part of, and I don't just mean to say in a design curriculum. When you step back and again, from your own experience or when you think and reflect on others that you've seen, what are the ways in which maybe you personally have learned how to be responsible leaders, responsible thinkers, what does that process look like? Um, and maybe in a design context, even if you're not formally designers. Um, and then uh, after we speak to that, we'll, I think, probably have time for one more of the, the Q&A questions. But curious, you know, again, personal reflection, personal experience, would love to hear, how does one become a responsible leader? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking back to, because this is almost coming up to a year of this pandemic, of everybody kind of being remote. And I never realized just how powerful, just how powerful like the words we say are as silly as that can sound like. And sometimes it is just those like small words of affirmation. Like I hear you, I got, I, I hear you, I can see you. I'm understanding what you're saying. And I've realized how much it's transformed, like how my team feel, just those moments of affirmation that I probably, I wouldn't say I neglected, but I just didn't really value or no, it's, probably not values, not, they probably just didn't feel as strong to me as they actually are. Um, and I guess if I was to put it in a design context, Evan, when you mentioned about this translation, it was making me think, hmm, there are things that just happen that you don't necessarily, you just, it's not that you don't care, you just don't recognize until it's very, very important. And I think kind of taking the time to be still and just listen and be, there's something about like being mindful and being present that allows you to even identify those opportunities, whether it comes to the interactions you have with people or with the people that consume whatever you're trying to create. Sometimes you're just gonna be quiet still and you hear and see things in a totally new way that you probably didn't in the past. Um, <laughs> I was just sitting with that for a moment. Um, no, I, I totally agree. I think that engineers have, uh, they are trained to jump into solving things, right? Jumping to solving problems like, oh, oh, I, I've thought of a fix of that, right? And to just sit with something and say, wow, that's complicated. I don't know if I have a solution. And being able to step back and say, who can I talk to about, you know, broadening my experience a little bit? Who can I talk to about, um, having a different perspective on this um, and bringing other people into the room, I think is, is so crucial. And um, 
not done often enough, perhaps, at least in a lot of the places I've looked at. So I feel like, uh, you know, when, when I think about leadership and when I think about, you know, technical work more generally, um, one thing that I think isn't talked about enough is all of the kind of soft skills of listening well, right? Sitting with something, um, being a really good team player, being able to, to read things and synthesize them, being able to present and write convincingly. <laughs> I, I always make my poor students who often come in with technical backgrounds um, write a lot and read a lot every week. And one thing I say is that this itself is something that is going to be really valuable for you in the workplace, right? Being able to read a lot and synthesize it all, being able to kind of write a compelling argument based on that is something that, you know, we don't often think about in, in more technical work. Um, I think designers do grapple with it a little bit more, but, um, but it is not something that really gets taught in many other classes in, um, you know, in, in data science, in, in more technical fields. Yeah, I think to me the the nerve the, the, the human nervous system <laughs> is the great frontier of the age. And like any frontier, it looks wide open. And what I what I mean, but but really like as soon as you start to move into that frontier, like with media, you start to create trauma, and usually in a way you're not seeing. And so when I think about leadership we're still so new in our understanding of our internal worlds, of how we feel, why we feel, of what the word spirituality means, why we think the way we think, that a lot of what I think makes great leaders is internal as much as it is external, right? So it's not just what direction are you choosing, it's how genuinely convicted do you feel that that's the right direction. It's not just how much you're communicating, it's how reciprocally are you communicating, how open and vulnerable are you being in that communication. It's not just how much are you talking about moral behavior, it's how much are you personally leaning into the light and doing your best to be ethical and to have good impacts. And so, um, you know, I think the most transformative leaders I've worked with, I've done a lot of inner work, have really helped themselves heal and remove negative states and then flourish. And, and have more positive states emotionally. And I think that translates into better management, better leadership and better, better teams. Great. And I know we only have a, a handful of minutes left. So maybe this last question is um, kind of a little bit of a, a speed round, if you will. <laughs> um, we've, we've talked uh, sort of big picture, come back down to more specific stories. One thing that's uh, become kind of a through line through a lot of this is really how do we balance the recognition that um, oftentimes the why do we make this is about results, sales, ROI, like all these kind of traditional measures. It's also about a lot of what we're talking about now, these very internal, more human ways of thinking about what is important. I'm just wondering, um, as we just sum up, you know, even just the 30 seconds where there's sort of final reflections, what, what are ways in which we can help other people think about, uh, again, from your own experiences, how do you balance those two? Um, how do we solve big problems that are sloppy and messy and also still, you know, keep sustainable businesses and recognize that we're also in this to kind of deliver the goods? Any sort of quick last thoughts on that before we wrap? makes me think of one thing that I was told about how do you eat an elephant and it's like what what is it one bite at a time and I, as you were talking I thought probably when I reflect on the work that I've been doing especially over the last let's say 12 to 18 months particularly around about this pandemic is that just the small wins breaking down big problems into small manageable things I think sometimes you can you can to the comment earlier on paralysis you can really get stuck when it comes to trying to solve a huge problem, but if you can break it down to small manageable bites and it's always more money, it feels a lot easier. You know, I don't, I don't, just the, the one thing that comes to mind for me is to always look for many different stories about any given situation or project to take many different views and to not, to not like, to be very conscious about seeing things from different perspectives, many different sites before making a decision, that one little change in how I behave, I think can have really big consequences. 
Um, I know we talked a little bit earlier about incentives, possible regulation in this space, right? And I feel like that might be the, the real way to balance th this kind of struggle pull between, you know, sales ROI and this kind of more, more human grounded piece. But, um, you know, without that, I feel like just having a sense of your own moral compass, what you stand for, um, and what is important to you is, is so important. And, and stepping away maybe from, again, that individual focus and looking at those bigger systemic issues. Excellent. Well, thank you all. I um, uh, really appreciate everyone's thoughtfulness, time, sharing your stories and experiences, right? We can learn from each other so much. These are all messy issues uh, that are complex, don't have easy answers, but so appreciate your um, being able to share that. Um, thank you also to those of you in the audience. Appreciate your taking time out of your busy lives and busy schedules to attend. Um, and just as a reminder, this is the first of a few series or a first of a few lectures in this series. Um, so the next one is coming up about a month from now, April 27th. I don't have the specific time, but it's about for whom are we making things? So this conversation was a little bit grounded in sort of what do we even think about when we're making them? Our next conversation next month will focus more on uh, specifics. Oh, so it's noon central time on April 27th, our next one. Um, so thank you, everyone. If any of the panelists do um, want to input any um, sort of LinkedIn contact information, um, I see that some folks are wanting to connect more and understand more from all of you. Uh, so the, the hour we just had was just a teaser. Um, but thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate this. Thank you, Ruth, for, for wonderful <laughs> moderation. <laughs> Great. Thanks, all. Bye.